Um, so thanks very much, Liana, for um, inviting us to talk today. Um, just a little quick overview of what we're going to speak about first, um, which hopefully you can see up on your screens. So we are aware that some people may know some of this information already, um, but we thought we'd just start at the beginning, just so everyone's kind of on the same level. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about what record is, in case anyone's not heard of us before, a bit about what makes up a biological record, how you can send those to us, um, and then my colleagues will go on later to talk to talk a little bit about what happens to the records when they come to us, um, and also why this is really important as well. So first of all, um, what is record? So record is the local environmental record centre for Cheshire, Houghton, Warrington, and the Wirral. So it's quite a mouthful, to be honest. We've got a very, very um, long name. Um, the second part is probably the most easy part to explain. Obviously, that's the area that we cover. So we are based in Chester, a very uh, glamorous office in the car park of Chester Zoo. Um, but we do cover the whole area, so the rest of Cheshire, Houghton, Warrington and the Wirral as well. So the first part of our name um, is quite well explained by this quote from ALERC, which is the Association of Local Environmental Record Centres, in case anyone's not heard of that before. Um, so there is a, a local environmental record centre for every part of the country. You can see all of the different ones on, on this map here. Uh, we're just over there, um, obviously, where the, the red arrow is in Cheshire. And the reason we're pointing this out is there could potentially be people listening from other parts of the country. Um, most of what we're saying is relevant anywhere. So all the stuff about kind of what a record is and why it's important will apply to you, whether you're within our area or not. But you will have your own um, record centre to deal with those records in your part of the country. So local environmental record centres um, collect, collate and manage information on the natural environment. So for the most part, that information comes in the form of biological records. So what exactly is a biological record? So put really simply, um, it's a record of a species being found at a certain place at a certain time by a certain person. So say, for example, you'd seen a butterfly in your garden. As a record centre, we really want you to tell us, about, tell us about this, tell us that you've seen it. But to make it useful to us, we do need to have a few key pieces of information. So this is the information which makes up what we call the biological record. So the first thing we need to know is what is it? Um, normally this would come in the form of what species is it? Can tell us about the subspecies if you know it, but likely for uh, in a lot of cases, um, quite tricky to identify invertebrates, for example, often to be their subspecies level. Um, if you aren't able to identify them to species level, um, we also understand as well, not everyone can be an expert and even experts can't generally be experts in every single thing. Um, so any information really is, is kind of useful. You could tell us what genus it is. Um, so that's the first part of the scientific name, yeah. I'm sure. Um, if you are, have, for example, species which can't be separated unless you sort of dissect them and look really closely at their genitalia and you aren't able to do that, you can just tell us the um, genus. That's absolutely fine. It's still really useful information to know. We also accept aggregates in certain cases as well. So this is basically um, sort of a kind of like a group of um, similar species, um, which we know are quite commonly recorded, but quite tricky to separate into species level. So a good example is not an invertebrate, but um, dandelions, for example, I think there's probably about 150, some might correct me, but there's, there's many, many species of dandelion in the UK, um, but not everyone is able to identify them to species level. Obviously, it's great if you can tell us exactly what species it is, but if you've just got a dandelion in your lawn, you want to tell us it's a dandelion and um, will accept an aggregate, which means it could be any one of those hundreds of dandelion species. One thing to point out here um, is to make sure you don't guess. So it sounds quite obvious, but um, you do need to put in the work to make sure that you're identifying something correctly. So use books, use the internet, and also ask other people. So there are a lot of experts out there that will be able to help, um, particularly if you have a photograph of whatever you've seen. So try and make the photo as detailed as you can. Um, if you're not sure how to get in touch with experts, just get in touch with us and we'll pass it on and try and find out as much as we can for you. We also want to know the date as well. This is obviously the date that you've seen the, um, well, whatever you are recording. 
Um, if you've seen something on a different date again, it can be recorded again, but if it's on the same date, um, make that the same record. So say for example, you saw a, a, a weed in your garden, you want to record that, it's there in the morning, you go in, have your lunch, go out, it's there in the afternoon again, quite obviously. Um, don't record it again, that would be the same record. But if you do see it there again the next day, then you can record that again as a separate record. We also want to know where it was found as well. And the best way of telling us this is to tell us the grid reference. So we could spend a, a whole talk talking about grid references, um, but to make it a little bit simpler, we're just going to try and tell you where to find the grid reference. And um, sometimes people get bit put off on this here yeah, they've got to find a grid reference might think it's it's quite complicated but it is pretty easy to be honest um you can use if you've got a, a smartphone for example you can download apps which tell you um which grid reference you're at at, at that time so the one on the left is just the one i've got on my phone at the moment and um, so all you need to do is obviously write down that number if you've not got your phone out with you when you're recording, you can um, have a look on the internet afterwards as well. So you can use Google Maps or you can use this website we quite like called ukgridrefencefinder.com, I think it is, something like that. Um, and you can have put in a postcode there to translate to a grid reference, find a point on the map that will give you the grid reference too. So it's a very handy tool if you want to look afterwards at where you've been. We tend to want at least six figures in the grid reference. The more figures there are, the more precise the location is. Um, so more is better, but um, at least six really for a, sort of a good record. Next thing you want to know is who saw it. So generally that is going to be you if you see it and you're able to identify it yourself. If you can't identify it, but someone else that you're with can, you can add them in as the determiner. So the observer is, is you, um, the determiner is the person who has identified it, it for you if you weren't unable to do so. So mostly records just have one kind of person with them that sometimes might have you for that reason. It's really important for us to know who you are. It might seem like a sort of unimportant thing, but if we do need to get in contact with you afterwards, um, we need to know where it came from. You might have spotted something really unusual um, and we need to try and verify that with you to make sure it was definitely what you said it was. So that's why we need to know who you are. The abundance is obviously how many there are. Um, often you won't be able to, well, often you, you may be able to, but you might not want to, for example, count up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of tiny, tiny insects or something. So it is completely fine just to put present if you want to tell us that it's there in any abundance. It could be one, could be 500. It's still a valid record if it just say present, it's there. Um, you could use abundance scales, for example, plants. You might have heard of the DAFO scale to sort of score how abundant it is by looking at, um, looking at sort of how, how many there are and estimating on that scale. Um, or like I said, you can just count them up if you are able to do so. We also want to know the sex, well, we don't have to, but we would like to know the sex slash the stage as well. So if it's a male or a female and you can identify that, put that in as extra information. You don't have to at all. Um, often it's going to be quite hard, particularly for a lot of invertebrates to do that. So if you don't know the, if it's a male or a female, that's absolutely fine. If you have seen one of each, um, make sure you put them in separate records as well, even if they're at the same place at the same time by the same person. Um, it just gets a bit messy for us if we've got like five males, 10 females in one record. Um, Alina might mention this later, though we've spent a lot of time kind of trying to separate them out. So much easier if they're just separate to start with. Um, you can also put the stage as well. This is quite important for invertebrates. There could be an egg, there could be a larva, there could be a pupa um, or an adult. Sometimes people forget that adult is a stage, but if you've seen an adult butterfly, for example, make sure you record that as an adult so we know what it is. Next bit of information, the last bit, is the record type. So basically that's how you saw it. So if you just saw something flying by um, on a leaf or something, that would be a field record normally. So that just tells us that, that you've seen it, that it's there. You can see evidence of things as well and also record that. And um, so for example, if you saw a, a, a molehill, uh, make sure you add molehill into the record types. That's evidence of that particular species. And you could record sort of feces. If for invertebrates, you might record a gall or, or a leaf mine or something, um, something in this category as well, if you'd seen that as evidence. Um, it is quite important because, for example, if, if we found we had loads of records of moles, but no record type, just a field record, we might expect there to be you know, hundreds of moles running around Cheshire, just 
going about their business, um, which would be quite random because normally you'd only see the molehill, they'd normally be underground. So make sure you tell us it's a molehill um, so that we know what kind of things we're looking at. So now you've got all of the kind of parts of the record, um, obviously we don't want you to keep this to yourself, we do want you to share this with us and there are a number of ways of doing so depending on um, your own preference really. So you could send us a paper record, you could just write it down and post it to the office or well normally hand it to the office but not now because we're not there but you could do that if we were in the office. Um, you could also send it electronically, um, so you could write it into an email with all the details, you could send us your spreadsheet with you know, multiple records in if you want with all the details or Word document, um, however you've got it really, you can send it to us and we've got volunteers that will enter that into our system. You can also enter it directly into our system, so if you go to our website you can have a look at RODIS which is our online data input system. Um, we haven't really got enough time to explain how to use it in this presentation, um, but if you do have any issues with it, then just get in touch and we can help you out with that. You can also use other applications as well. So a good one, which you might have heard of, is iRecord. Um, so you can use that to, to kind of make an account, keep a record of, of everything that you've spotted. You can add in all the details that we talked about on the, on the previous slide, and we do kind of harvest records from there so if it, if it is recorded on iRecord it will make its way to us eventually it might take a little bit longer than if you were to send it direct but we will um, gather those records too. One really big advantage with um, iRecord is that other people can look at your records so it could be experts for that certain species group they can have a look and see if you've got it right so if you had a photo with your record um, they can help with the ID and confirm what you've ID'd is correct. Another one is iNaturalist, which is very similar to iRecord. Um, it does rely a little bit more on having a, a photo, this one, to kind of verify the records. But it's really good if you're first starting out, so if anyone's just kind of starting out with recording, it's really easy to use, um, really quick to add things in. The other advantage with these is that you can um, they take your grid reference automatically too, so you don't even need to look at another map or anything. It just knows where you are if you've got your phone with you and adding it in, you know, as you've seen it it will take that of reference automatically. So now you know what a record is and how to send it to us, I'm going to pass over to Alina um, who can explain what happens after that. Great, so once the data arrives um, to us at the record in the various ways that Iona just explained, it's normally myself that checks the data for complete lists, so of the criteria that Iona mentioned at the beginning, what species it is, where and when it was found, and so on. If any of these criteria are missing, um, I will contact the recorder or the person that has sent the data to us, just to make sure that it's all together and that we can then enter it. So it depends on the format. Um, how we enter it, either we enter it into RODIS or we will import it into RODIS if it's an Excel file. And depending on how we receive the data, verification happens at different stages. So like Iona said, if you use an iNaturalist or iRecord, they normally have their own verification process. If it is sent to us on paper, if it's in ecological reports or Excel files, we will look after the verification process, um, which either happens in RODIS or um, we will send batches of data to a verifier. For those who don't know what verification is, it simply means that an expert of a particular species group has a look at the records of that species group and just make sure that these are all correct so that we don't have, for example, a random gray seal turning up in the middle of the county. Okay, so after we've then imported into the database, the most immediate use is our commercial inquiries, which Iona is mainly looking after. So whenever a development project is planned, However small it is, big, it could just be a house extension or um, it could be a new Aldi store. Um, the the um, private person or company needs to consult an ecologist um, just to check what species are in the area of that proposed development. 
the ecologist then, which could be an independent um, ecologist or a big consultancy, should contact us as part of their preliminary desk study to give them a first idea what data um, and what species are found within their search area. We also work with a variety of partners, such as the Tineptera Trust today and the Liverpool Museum, Chester Zoo, the Cheshire Wildlife Trust, We're a Wildlife, Natural England, and so on, as well as um, specific recording groups, including the fairly new Cheshire Bee Group, Moth Butterfly Groups, and so on. And we exchange data with these and work on a variety of conservation projects, as well as creating species checklists and atlases. So just a um, quick note on atlases for those who don't know what they are. They're basically mapped species records of a group of species. For example, this one um, is for bees, wasps and ants, and it's normally for a um, specific county. So here we've got um, the Beast was an Ant's Atlas of Cheshire. And then normally what it includes is the family, the genus, and the species. Each, each species will have their own species map. It will have some information about the habitat, the flight period, and so on. And it will also have different year ranges, so what year the species were found, and then where in the county you can find these atlases either on the Tineptera Trust website here, or we also have them on our website on record lrc.co.uk. I have also started analyzing and displaying some of our data in our newsletter, which we release twice a year. And in our last issue, I looked at all of the data we had until that point. And for the current issue, I looked at data from just the year 2017, um, but I won't tell you anything about it. You can yeah, read about that all yourself. We've just released it. And um, if you are not signed up to our mailing list, you can do this via the link here, or just go onto our website and in the top right corner, it should say sign up to our mailing list. And then lastly, a project that I've been working on with the help of Eric, um, but that we had to put on hold due to the current situation, is our unrecorded and underrecorded grid squares. So what I've done here is mapping all of our records from 2010 onwards, um, as we wanted to look at more up-to-date data. These are all mapped in one kilometer grid squares, just to make it a bit easier to look at the data and we're then trying to find out um, where our most and our least recorded areas are. So you can see here the darker um, squares are the ones with more records and the lighter the color gets the lesser um, records we have for that area or we also have some gaps here so that means we don't have any records in those areas. You can see this particularly on the whirl on the outsides here um, although we filled a few records here with, um, with a recording group this year. Um, so yeah, that's just, um, if you know the area, that's all beach and water. So, um, and so you will only find marine invertebrates there. So that's another thing that we're trying to encourage people to go out and record invertebrate, uh, marine invertebrates. Um, and um, we're also trying to look at more recorded species versus less recorded species, which surprisingly are um, normally the more common species because people just don't think about recording them because they're just there. But it's really, really important for us to track these species as well and then to look at their increase and or decrease of their populations. Right, so um, now I'll hand over to Eric who'll tell you a bit more about certain species trends and some more data. Okay, All right, thank you very much Alina. Um, as um, said previously, I'm Eric Fletcher, I'm the manager of Record, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance um, of recording invertebrates. Um, uh, and really I've just got some, it will be a whistle stop because it's a, a short presentation and it's just the sort of salient points, hopefully. 
Um, uh, and really, I've just broken it down into sort of uh, basic headings and the way I, and these are sort of personal things that I think are the most important um, in my time at record. So, um, first of all, is in, in, um, in no particular order, I must point out, um, is informing conservation work. So, clearly, um, the data that we provide um, is used by conservation workers to ensure that the, the sites are. Uh, um, sites that might be important for invertebrates are, are managed as such. So um, a, a good example would be um, a site needing some scrub clearance work um, and obviously access to the data can ensure that, that the right scrub is removed and the, um, uh, and the stuff that is a food plant for particular inverts um, is left behind. So, so that type of thing is, is quite important and again is, is, is useful for, for um, ensuring that our sensitive sites are maintained uh, in, a, in a proper way. Clearly the, uh, the data that we get in um, is, made, is also made available to the planning um, process as um, said by um, both Alina and Iona. Um, and it's crucial really to that um, process that the invertebrate data is made available and is made and is, is highlighted really because unfortunately as, as alluded to previously, um, you know, people can't be experts in everything, and often um, entomological expertise is 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 an, isn't as um, as as strong as it might be within um, the ecology sector. So, certain there are certain experts out there, but there are um, gaps in in our understanding, and that's true across the board. So, it's really important for us to be able to make that data available to to inform planning decisions. And particularly so on a on a local level. Um, equally, the data that we pull in and we make available can help identify important sites on a local level um, and a national level. So clearly, um, where we've got some interesting um, relic uh, heath sites and and other sites with an interesting assemblage of species on there, those need to be um, that data needs to be made available. Um, to the relevant people so that those decisions can be made and relevant um, protections being applied to those sites, as well as um, uh, incorporation into local planning schemes and into local um, protection, uh, and even potentially being taken on um, for long-term uh, conservation by the likes of the Local Wildlife Trust or, or other conservation bodies. And finally, the, the, the I guess that the thing that Bring, brings everything that we do together is that this idea of building a greater understanding and for me that's why I've got the top there understanding equals greater protection the, for me there's, a, there's this sort of saying that um, um, you, you uh, how does the saying go you never miss it until it's gone well that's all well and good um, but you can't do that in terms of biodiversity because once it's gone it's gone and that for me is, is really important. And no, nowhere is it more important than with the invertebrates now. I mean, we are in such a position that, that things are uh, incredibly uh, precarious and it's up to us to, to, to basically stop that, that um, basically degrading of our environment. And the way we do that is by recording. The more we record, the more we can understand what's going on and the, more we, the better able we are to target our, our work. Clearly, um, monitoring and, and um, the likes of uh, that sort of focused recording is absolutely imperative on, on particular sites, such as the work that's going on at Chester Zoo on their nature reserve. But that is, fits into a wider picture of, of species monitoring um, and species recording, invertebrate recording across the UK. And um, I've got some examples now that hopefully might illustrate some of those things. So. Um, First of all, we've got um, a, a species called Hydrocara caraboides. Um, this is the lesser silver water beetle. Um, and this was um, basically restricted to uh, the Somerset levels. And it's a, a species that was um, really a very, very, very um, rare species. Um, it used to be fairly widespread, I believe, um, some many years ago. But then um, due to changes in intensification in agriculture and things like that, it was basically it's range restricted and it was only found on the Somerset levels until um, in 1990s when um, it was first recorded in Cheshire 
And the interesting thing about this species is that um, in its um, sort of previous range in Somerset, it was known basically from the ditch networks. And um, the difference in its habitat requirements in Cheshire is quite quite interesting in the fact that it's um, found in Cheshire in sort of um, heavily poached mile pits and not necessarily in the ditches. So again, you're seeing a, a difference in habitat requirement, which is actually quite an interesting thing. And they wouldn't have known that about the, the particular species if somebody hadn't found it in Cheshire and then started looking at it in more detail. Um, and just as a point of interest, um, I couldn't get a very good picture of Hydrocara, so I've got a reasonably good picture of a Hydrocara egg cocoon, which is that thing that's floating in the water there with a little hook on the top of it. Um, yeah, so that's just as a, a, as a uh, by the by. Um, second is our, um, of our species is Bombus hypnorum, which is the tree bumblebee. Um, an interesting one, this one, because it was first recorded in, in about 2001 down um, down south and um, it's a it basically then made a very quick I would say um, spread up the country until um, it was found in Cheshire in 2010 it made its appearance pretty well known by um, flying straight through the window of the record office and onto the desk of um, my former colleague Tom Hunt who then uh, potted it up and said I think this is something different um, and sure enough Carl Clee confirmed that it was tree bumblebee and um, that was the, the, the first record of, for, in, for Cheshire. Again, a really interesting species because it has now completely covered the country um, and it's found pretty much in everywhere in mainland Britain, including some odd records up in the highlands now. So this species has had a, a, an amazing, has been amazingly um, successful in colonizing. And again, it's the records that, that show us um, how quickly this thing is moving. So again, just a, quite an interesting species there. And two more. Um, uh, another one is um, Agalastocorolli, the other leaf beetle. Again, really interesting um, story. Uh, it was considered extinct in the UK um, and um, interestingly rediscovered in Manchester in 2004. It was um, as I'm led to believe, um, I'm sure I'll be corrected on this because there's probably people in the audience who might be able to correct me on this, but as I'm led to believe, it was found on a bus stop in Manchester. So um, really interesting that this thing was found on a bus stop in Manchester. Its host, um, its host plant for the, um, for the, for the larvae is um, grey alder, actually. Um, however, in the northwest, it seems to be very, very keen on... Um, on black alder or Alnus glutinosa, and it absolutely festoons the the trees in the uh, you know in the larva and the um, adults. It literally just eats them bare. So it's quite an interesting thing, really. Um, and the spread of this is really interesting because it's it's found also found in Nottinghamshire and um, Hampshire in 2014, and it's also been found. The first records of it in Wales were 2018. However, there's a big gap. According to the data, there's a big gap between the Northwest and the Nottinghamshire and Hampshire um, records. Um, and I, we're not sure why that is. Why is that? Is that because it's just not been picked up? People haven't identified it? Or is there something else going on there? Are these two, two separate um, um, uh, sort of outbreaks or introductions into the UK? I don't know. So again, that's why the records are important. We can find these trends and we can pull them apart and, and that information builds a better picture. And it's particularly important when these species are pest species. Fortunately, though, um, Agalastica only, I wouldn't say is necessarily a pest species. So, um, And finally, um, is the Atelotus plebeus, the Cheshire horsefly. Again, which is a really interesting species. Um, it's basically rediscovered since the 20th century um, last year um, in Cheshire, and it's it's basically its range is restricted to the Cheshire Basin and um, Myers. And again, a very interesting species because it's, um, it's literally very, very restricted and it's classed by the IUC and the International Union for Conservation of Nature um, as a, a, an endangered species. 
Um, a fascinating one, really. I mean, if nothing else, just for its looks. Um, I have to be honest, a really interesting thing. And if I had that land on me, I probably would be a little bit um, apprehensive. Um, but yes, a fascinating species. And again, it's the the willingness for people to go out with different um, uh, recording methodologies into areas that you probably wouldn't go um, unless you were had a vested interest um, into the middle of a bog uh, in your waders just to look for a fly is, is quite impressive. But that's the importance, you know, it, it shows how important this species is, shows how important this um, species is in the wider grand scheme of things in terms of um, protection for that site. If we lose, um, lose it on these sites, we lose it. And that's, you know, as I say, a very important thing. Okay. Um, so to look at some of the data that we've got, to look at what, um, to put this in sort of context as to what, um, what species we have um, and how well they are recorded and why it's important to not just look at the, the um, really interesting or the common, um, but to look wider. Um, hopefully this will give you an idea as to, uh, to where we're missing data as it were. So, okay. Um, a big list of numbers and a list of uh, species groups. First thing I wanted to point out was this here. So if you can see at the top there, the record counts of the lep for the Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moss, um, 131,842. And that represents, um, that's basically, that's over double the entire rest of this list. So it gives you an idea as to how heavily recorded that, those, that, that group is. And this is just from 2010 onwards. From 2010 onwards, Lepidoptera has been recorded more than double the amount of everything else. I find that quite staggering. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but it just to me that is a quite an interesting stat. Um, um, and whether that means anything, I don't know, but it's it just an interesting point of interest. So if you were to go out and you're just about to set out on your um, on your um, career path to become a, a budding entomologist, maybe not Lepidoptera. I don't want to <laughs> steer anybody away from that, but just maybe not Lepidoptera. Um, okay, next thing I, I thought was really interesting was the, <clears throat> the records for the dragonflies. So the, the Odonata have been, um, dragonflies and uh, damselflies have been recorded, We've got 6,000 records, but only 43 species. And that I find again absolutely um, baffling that 43 species in Cheshire have been recorded 634 times. And interestingly, even though Lepidoptera has been recorded um, 131,000 times, it's of 986 species. So on average, each one of the 986 species have been recorded 133 times whereas the dragonflies have been recorded 140 times. So I think, again, quite an interesting stat, although I don't really know what I make of that and how I can do, but it, it's, it, to me, it, it sort of um, makes me think that something else needs to be done there, some more work needs to be done on, on, on that. Some, I'll leave that to a statistician now. But yeah, just really interesting um, figures to see there, I think. And finally, um, on this uh, slide, um, I don't know whether anybody else thinks this is odd but I think that figure is odd um, I wouldn't necessarily expect to see mites in the um, in a sort of top list of uh, recorded uh, invert, spe uh, invert species however or invert groups however the prostigmata um, contains the area fired mites which are the gall causes and I can pretty much guarantee that most of those will be gall records as opposed to the actual individual gall causes. But yeah, just a really interesting um, point there. And I'm actually really pleased to see it because um, I don't think galls are that heavily recorded, but to actually see them appearing in here is a, is a good thing. And finally, um, just to give you an idea, not just um, what's important to record, but where it is important to record. Um, in terms of invertebrates. You'll notice here um, in the map, it is just a general map. And again, it is just from um, 2009 onwards, so the last 20 years. 
if you look you can see clearly a, a sort of um a bias towards urban fringe so you've got lots of urban fringe records and those again will be things like the brownfield sites um it might be that entomologists don't move about very far um and they just they only sort of step off the doorstep although if you're in recording invertebrates it takes a lot of time so maybe that's it maybe a walk only gets you um a walk recording invertebrates only gets you like half a mile down the road then you've got to go back in because the day's gone but it's an interesting stat um and it's the, these gaps into the wider environment that that interests me the most i guess people could say well you know there is this idea of a green desert out there but that's not not always true and in fact there are some some amazing sites further into the wild so um it's an interesting stat but it does still seem to be that our brownfield sites create quite a lot of interest and um, obviously there are certain sites like delamere which you can see on here right just near Kelsol here that um, uh, remain quite well recorded but it's into the wider environment are the are those areas that we need to get out um, and do some more recording and um, which again will link into the work that Alina's doing and will um, expand that out wider as we go forward okay um, and that's it for me thank you very much for listening um, uh, I guess we have time for questions okay thank you Eric um, if you want to stop sharing your screen then we can go into questions if yeah if anybody has a question um, you can either put it into the chat or put your hand up virtually and ask it out loud I have a question, if that's okay. I don't know if you yes. can hear me. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's just with regards to um, records that you make on the app, so iNaturalist or iRecord, what's the kind of time scale with how long that takes to get to you and, and how long it takes for the verification and stuff to get into record? Nobody's taken their mic off mute, so I think it's probably me who's going to answer that then. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> Ultimately, um, it, it very much depends on us in terms of the, um, the, the download. So instead of it being a sort of push um, system where iRecord or iNaturalist um, push the data out to us as an update, we just go in and grab it and bring it in. And that really, um, we've been spending quite a bit of time over the last six months, I think, making sure that we're bang up to date with the data from um, iRecord. Um, however, during that six months, six months have passed. So, you know, it, it's that sort of thing. But I think we have, um, I think it's maybe three months or something now. Would you say, Alina? I know you did the last. Um, the it last was, I'm sure it was January, February where we last downloaded it. Yeah, okay, and so then we had to discuss a few things because sometimes people submitted via various channels, so we have to filter those out. So sometimes it can take quite a long time to go through these and make sure that yeah. we don't have any duplicates. But yeah, it's something that we're just about to do again, another updated yeah. download. Yeah, and once we've got that, um, once we've improved our, our system for dealing with that, then obviously that will become more regular. And clearly, as we're, we're keen to get people to use the different um, tools, we then need to improve our methods of accessing that and, and bringing them in and it's just a, a case of sort of um, smoothing that process down so i would think ideally i'd be looking at something like once maybe every three months maybe even a, um, shorter than that but it just depends um on a number of records coming through and resource in the office so but we would be looking at something like that secondly in terms of um uh, verification um, that is a little more difficult. Ultimately, we are keen to verify at our level. So when we get hold of the data, we would pass it out to verifiers um, for them to look at our local verifiers because they have that local understanding. That isn't always necessary because um, there are certain verifiers who verify locally, but also verify on iRecord. So um, I know Tony Parker's here with us today and Tony does exactly that. So that's um, useful because obviously it's already been done at that end. We can bring that data to us. We know it's verified and it's out for, for use straight away. 
and we would then just maybe batch off what we've got our own that have come through other means as Alina said earlier on and pass that across to Tony so it would only be those that, that would necessarily need to go to Tony but that's not always the case because not as you can imagine not everybody is using iRecord in terms of experts uh, county recorders um, and in those in that case we basically would draw the data in and then probably batch it up and pass it out to them um, for them to look at because I mean, again, it does depend on who it is that's looking at it. Some people prefer um, an Excel spreadsheet to come to them. They will trawl through that in their spare time and then pass it back to us, and we will make those verification changes to the data. Or alternatively, it will um, they'll you know want to look at uh, an online portal or deal with it in a different way. So yeah, that tends to be that. Hopefully, that's answered the question. Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> Steve, you've got a question? Yeah, okay, thanks. For... Eric? Yeah? As I understand it, Google is going to stop Chrome allowing running of mm. full apps at the end of December this year. Yeah. It's getting remarkably close. Mm. If Chrome is not going to allow Flash apps to run, that also means the new Microsoft Edge will not the Opera will not, and AVG browser will not. What are the current plans to move forward to another platform? Um, very good question, Steve. Um, I l I'm led to believe that Microsoft, I think, might be softening their stance on um, on uh, Flash, but I, I'm so I've read, but I'm I'm not sure whether that's still the case or not. Anyway, the the crux of the matter is that the, um, we are adopting a HTML5 uh, product which um, is being helped or being delivered, designed um, by Greater Manchester Local Environmental Record Centre. They, it's something that they're using and because we've had a, a good working relationship with them previously in that they've adopted RODIS and they've had a, um, a good number of recorders using RODIS up to, up to this point, um, we will be adopting that, and I believe it's in its yeah. final. Um, I say I believe it is in its final incarnation before we go live. Um, we're just waiting for the the final touches, um, and then we're going to start testing it properly. Um, staff members have had um, a, a, a look at it, and we've had a, sort of an exclusive kind of view of it, and it looks really good as far as I'm concerned. It's just that we need them to um, basically bring it across to us, upload it on our server, which will take a bit of time, um, and then um, put the links out for people to start testing it in, it, in, its, in its sort of, you know, in earnest, really. Um, but it will be definitely, he says, it will definitely be before uh, uh, December. As I say, it, it, I, the Paul at... Uh, Greater Manchester is really good and he's been um, keeping us up to date um, regularly. Um, and the, but the last one was a, maybe a month ago, four weeks ago, something like that. Um, and basically he'd said, you know, the package is pretty much there. We just need to then arrange time for us to start migrating it across. But obviously um, COVID-19 is, is still yeah. causing some issue with that. But um, yeah. Well, that's excellent news. Thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. I'm hoping it will be very shortly. So. Okay, excellent. On a, a, another slightly related topic, uh, at the beginning of all this today, Iona mentioned iNaturalist in her presentation. Mm -hmm. um, how are you finding downloading data from iNaturalist and how are you able to use it? Um, another good question. <laughs> and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fudge this one because um, I can tell you that this, um, uh, we've had a look at it, but we've not done anything with it yet, Steve. Okay. So it's, the, it's the reason for me asking the question yeah. was the fact that obviously, as a local record centre, your not just preference but absolute essential is to have a named recorder for each of the records. Yeah. My naturalist has a named recorder, but very, very sadly those names tend to be nicknames or avatar names, et cetera, not the full person's name with contact details. Mm. I was just wondering how you were going to get around that. 
Um, I think um, it's going to have to be a um, sort of a, a recorder key method. So going back to iNaturalist and when we have any queries on it, going and um, basically doing it through iNaturalist itself. So actually trying to um, approach the recorder through iNaturalist. Okay. Um, I think so, Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm not hugely familiar with it, but it's it's it, it from from what I what I've seen of it, you can do that type of thing. So well, that's um, good to know. Yeah. So so it might, might be worth both yourselves and Ben at Biobank sort of discussing it because he wants to be able to use the data from the Merseyside side as do you from the Cheshire side. Yeah. 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 And if there are any sort of tricks or tips that can be passed mm. between you. I think it would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I definitely will do, yeah. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, do we have any more questions from anybody? No, I think that's it. So, yeah, thank you, Alina, Iona and Eric. Um, yeah. <laughs> Happy recording, everybody. <laughs> and you, mate. Good to see you all. Yeah, and you. you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Take care. See you soon. <laughs>